Well, it's Friday night, and this is J.D. Simo coming to you from the funky basement in the house of Greece. It must be time for Greasy Time. Welcome, everybody. Let's have some fun.
show everybody i'm jd simo coming at you episode 13 i think of uh greasy time and uh couldn't be prouder to be with you tonight i'm feeling really good in a great mood and uh grateful to be playing some guitar and talking about music my favorite thing in the world tonight with lovely folks out there so we'll put james brown back up that's James getting his hair done. Um, he used to get his hair done every night before the show, no matter where he was, no matter uh, if he was on a television show, if he was, no matter what, he had his his hair care regimen with him at all times. And uh, I, I remember a story, um, that if I'm not mistaken, uh, when he played the Letterman show back in the early 80s when Hiram Bullock and Steve Jordan were in the band, the world's most dangerous band, uh, I think they tell, I think the story goes that they went back into the dressing room to, to meet James and uh, James was in there and uh, the Reverend Al Sharpton was actually doing his hair for him. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, it's a good story. So anyway, welcome to Greasy Time, everybody. I'll throw the logo up and um, I'll throw the uh, Venmo and PayPal up. Uh, times are hard for everybody, and my heart goes out to uh, to all of my all of my fellow musicians, all of my fe fellow human beings. Um, uh, as uh, the surge of cases kind of is starting to get out of control again here in America, and. Um, you know, it continues to be completely unsure of when we can go back to work. So, um, if you uh, if you find it in your heart that you'd like to throw something in the tip jug, throw something in the Venmo or PayPal for for old JD here in my humble house of grease, uh, I would be forever grateful. Uh, thank you very much in advance. Uh, so uh, tonight uh, the episode's going to be about psych psychedelic. Whoa. The ghosts of psychedelics speak upon you. They compel you. They compel you. Anyway. Um, but tonight's episode is going to be about psych. Um, and I'm going to spotlight uh, five records, sort of purposely in different genres of music, that sort of spearheaded uh, what I consider to be a milestone forward um, with sort of the, uh, the use of what is known as psychedelic tendencies and that can mean a lot of different things so we're going to talk about that um, later on in the show um, and uh, I'm also going to talk about uh, on the rig of the week this week not necessarily about a piece of gear but actually a, a concept that keeps coming up in conversations I have with people um, so we got that and we have a new uh, as every week have a new song and music video to premiere at the end of the show uh, tonight, uh, we have a, a tune that Adam and I put together called Coffee, uh, C-O-F-F-Y, not like the coffee you drink, and I'll talk about that a little later. Um, so uh, anyway, so to start off the show, let's, uh, uh, I'd like to actually give two kind of really groovy updates. Um, I've had a really amazing week because I continue to be in contact with incredible peers um, of mine, you know, musicians and bands and artists that I really love and respect. And we're all in the same boat, essentially, uh, obviously. And the amount of connection through social media, um, the amount of times where I've kind of, um, usually through Instagram, like, we get connected we get connected and then we inevitably exchange our phone numbers and then we're on the phone for an hour catching up on things or we're texting in the middle of the night and throwing stuff back and forth and bouncing ideas back and forth it's just crazy how awesome it's been 
and it makes me very excited um, for when the pan this pandemic stuff is all over, or at least subsided somewhat, um, all of these connections, all of this sense of community that I've, that I've found myself right in the middle of. Um, and actually, one thing I want to talk about right away is actually something that just happened today. I was, uh, um, myself and my dear friend, Kirk Fletcher, uh, some of you all out there probably know Kurt. He's one of the best you know, R&B, you know, blues, you know, he's one of the best guitar players in the world, and uh, he's a dear, dear friend of mine, uh, I love him dearly, and uh, he actually lives in Switzerland now, he's from LA, um, but he moved to Switzerland recently, and, uh, or in the last few years, I should say, and we were talking on the phone, we hadn't talked in a while, and we talked on the phone about some stuff, and we're catching up, and uh, Actually, he posed the idea of, man, we should do something together because we're both record geeks, okay? And we both appreciate a lot of the same stuff, um, uh, or at least comp highly complimentary. And, uh, and so he's like, we should do something together. And so we are, actually. We're going to do, on Monday, myself and my dear friend uh, Kirk Fletcher on Instagram, uh, we're going to do our first... Uh, brother from another mother live stream uh, we're going to do it uh, Monday afternoon at 1 p.m. Eastern um, and so obviously that'll be you know roughly between 7 and 9 o'clock uh, at night for all you people over in Europe um, but we're going to we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about all types of stuff we're going to talk about our favorite records we're going to we're going to talk about just things that we both love and, um, you know, Kirk's just a lot of mad respect for Kirk, and I love him dearly, and I, I, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, so tune in Monday on Instagram for uh, the first episode of the Brother from Another Mother live stream with my, myself and the amazing Kirk Fletcher, uh, which is going to be great. Um, and uh, another thing that I wanted to talk about right off the bat here, um, I've talked about it on the show, but because of the uh, hecticness of uh, when Adam was my guest, we didn't end up talking about this as much as I meant to, and I've meant to talk about it multiple times since then, but actually Adam has an awesome weekly live stream himself. Um, if you're on Instagram, follow him. His, uh, his, name, his tag name is at Adam Abershoff. And every Sunday night at uh, 7 o'clock Central, um, he does a dual drum jam uh, with the great Dale Harper, who's a fantastic drummer from here in, here in Nashville. And um, if you follow him on Instagram, which all of you watching this should, because he, he really puts up awesome uh, content. Um, and he's, you know, he's my other half. He's my, he's, he's my wife. He's my other wife, as my wife likes to, likes to say. And uh, I love him dearly, so make sure to do that and uh, throw at him some love, okay? So I wanted to talk about those things right off the bat. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, man, it's just really cool. Um, there's a lot of things in the works. There's a lot of collaborations, uh, both recorded and otherwise, that um, are actually kind of being worked out. Um, and uh, it's just really cool, because we're all home, you know, because that's the thing, is like, you know, if you're a touring musician, um, you know, you you uh, you mean to stay more in contact with all your friends. You mean to um, want to do things with them, but it takes time and it takes effort. And you know, all of us are, for the most part, you know, really kind of blue collar in that. You know, every gig, you know, every bit of merch, every session, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's like that's how we make our living. So we're always kind of going from one thing to the next, and so oftentimes collaborative things that we really want to do end up just getting kind of put off or forgotten about or you know so on and because we're all at home and wanting to be creative and wanting to do things you know um, we're all reaching out to each other and we're all talking to one another and we're all making plans and and following through on them too so uh, lots of cool stuff coming up so uh, are you still with me gonna have a good time so let's go ahead and jump into our records of the week. Uh, I'm really excited about um, about the ones this week. 
Um, I'm always excited about them because I live to listen to records every day. That's just my favorite thing to do. Um, so uh, without further ado, the first one I want to talk about is uh, from uh, about a year ago, two years ago actually. This is uh, Duran Jones and the Indications. This is their first album. Um, I love this band a lot. I know that it's probably not a new record to a lot of you. Um, in particular, their performance live on uh, Paste uh, of them doing their cover of Is It Any Wonder. I mean, that has like 17 million views or something like that. But these guys are just, these guys are, are, the, are the shit. And um, uh, Duran Jones, the front man, and uh, in particular, his amazing drummer, who's also the singer of Is It Any Wonder, Aaron Frazier. Uh, I love this record. I got a great um, uh, vinyl copy of it, and uh, just great modern soul. I love the the song "Smile." Um, I love the song "Groovy Babe" a lot. Um, the production on it, the plan, the singing, the harmonies, the writing, the arranging. Um, but that that version of "Is It Any Wonder" is just fire, man. I mean, it's just crushing. So. Um, so at any rate, uh, that's my first one. And as always, folks, these are all available to stream on uh, Spotify or Apple Music or wherever you listen to music. Uh, my next one is uh, Miles Davis on the Corner. Uh, I, I've pretty much, I was talking to Adam the other day about this. I really think this is pretty much my favorite um, record um, of Miles's. Um, I love Bitches Brew, I love Tribute to Jack Johnson, I love Milestones, I love Kind of Blue, uh, I love In a Silent Way, um, and several others, but this is just my favorite. Um, so this record, you know, uh, for those who are familiar, I apologize, but you know, this is two records after Bitches Brew. Um, so his Miles' shift, you know, I talked about In a Silent Way a couple of weeks ago on my Records of the Week, and how that was sort of the beginning of this kind of shift towards um, the incorporation of you know psychedelia and and funk and uh, more electronic um, uh, components, you know, electric bass and fuzz tones and all that kind of stuff, electric guitar. Uh, but this is two records later, and this is you know, if James Brown played acid jazz, you know, this is what it would be I think you know this is I, I love this record I listened to it a lot this week uh, me and Adam in particular we've listened to this a bunch and we we grooved on this this, rec this week as well um, something to note um, about this album is uh, you know Miles I've been very vocal about talking about the great Betty Davis on the show and her incredible influence on Miles when she was when she was dating and married to him uh, before her awesome musical career um, but another guy who was involved with Miles at this time who was kind of a muse as well is this guy right here uh, this is Michael Henderson who's the bass player on, on the corner uh, Michael Henderson um, he was in Stevie Wonder's band and he didn't know who Miles Davis was Okay, uh, kind of like Betty Davis didn't know who Miles was um, so Michael when he was approached to play with Miles, which may have been just from Miles personally, he didn't he didn't really know much about him. He he kind of like asked his buddies and his cohorts like you know this guy Miles Davis after me gig you know should I and everybody's like are you kidding man you got to do it that's Miles Davis. So um, Michael's influence from a from a funk R and B you know I mean he's a young guy who was influenced by contemporary music. And very kind of different from Miles um, up to this point because even you know as funky as Dave Holland was playing bass in the Bitches Brew era you know Dave is very much a jazzer you know Dave came from the jazz background studying guys like Ron Carter and, and you know it's it's you know so it was kind of like an evolution for him whereas Michael is very much kind of not that at all which is one of the things that Miles really loved about Michael um, so anyway, I wanted to mention and talk about Michael for a minute, uh, talking about this album. But anyway, On the Corner, that's my record number two this week. Listen to it a bunch. Um, I'm surprised that up to this point I've never had a Prince record as a record of the week, but that's going to change because this week um, I've got uh, The Rainbow Children. Um, this is an album of Prince that 
I never hear people talk about. Um, everybody talks about, you know, obviously his, you know, his his grandiose era in the '80s, and bits and pieces from the '90s and the 2000s. But this is my favorite record, period, of Prince's whole catalog. Uh, this came out around 2001, so this is coming out sort of on the heels of, you know, Voodoo came out, D'Angelo's Voodoo came out. And this is a very varied record. There's definitely more jazz influence, especially on the title track, man. If, if all you do is listen to the 10-minute title track, which is the first song on the record, I mean, that's worth the price of admission. I mean, it's an incredible piece of music. The sonic textures, the, the improv on it, uh, the creativeness of it, the vocal melodies, the vocal arrangements, um, and the playing. Um, some of the best guitar playing, you know, like jazz type of guitar playing and comping, as well as everything else you would imagine coming from Prince. And also, there's a lot of Prince's keyboard playing on this record, too, very much kind of in the style of Donny Hathaway. Um, but this is, yeah, I love this this record. Um, and uh, Muse to the Pharaoh is another one of my favorite tracks from this record. So uh, anyway, check out the Rainbow Children. This is a great record. and. I just never hear people talk about it. And uh, next is not necessarily an album, but it's a collection of songs uh, that's out right now. Uh, Penrose is a new subsidiary to uh, Daptone. Uh, Gabe uh, Roth, one of the two founders of Daptone, moved back to Riverside, his where he's from, in California, and uh, has sort of ignited this next phase in his creative life uh, producing and putting out uh, singles for for now of artists from the Southern California scene and kind of in particular kind of that kind of low rider um, you know uh, retro scene that's very popular in that area right now um, especially in low rider culture and um, they've put out I think it's five five forty fives that they've put out um, the Sacred Souls is one act. Um, an amazing song called Can I Call You Rose, which again is just fire, man. It's, it's crazy how good it is. And the flip side, uh, Week For Your Love, which is which I actually love more than the A side. Um, and uh, The Sinceres is, is, is the other act, and they put out a, a, a 45 uh, called Seems Like, which is really great. Uh, Jason Joshua, um, which is kind of more... A little bit more of that kind of, you know, that that sort of Mexican American influence um, in his stuff. Uh, he has a 45 uh, called "The Language of Love," which is really beautiful. Um, and the Altons, oh my gosh, the Altons! I love them so much. That's probably my favorite. They have a single out right now on Penrose uh, called uh, "When You Go." That's where you when you'll know. And the flip side of it is over and over. And those are probably my two favorite songs of this year. Um, I've listened to them so many times and they're just beautiful songs just so beautiful and uh, I look forward to hearing a lot more from the Altons um, and then the other the last group uh, featured on Penrose is Los Yesterdays which is which is two 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 guys there from from Southern California and Gabe Roth on bass and and Tommy Brennick one of my favorite guitar players on guitar who also lives out there now and they have a, a song called Tell Me I'm Dreaming and another song called Time, which is sort of, which is, you know, in keeping with the other, time is a little psychedelic. Um, but anyway, you can find just the Penrose singles that what I have posted, that picture I have posted up there, volume one. Just listen to them all if you haven't already. They're just fantastic. I love them. Big fan. And uh, they can't even keep the 45s in stock. I don't even know how many they've sold now of all of these. Um, they'll do posts on Instagram or Twitter, um, you know, like every few weeks when another shipment like gets shipped out to record stores, and literally they'll be sold out like within minutes. Um, hugely, hugely popular. This new Penrose uh, imprint, and I'm a big fan. Um, and then my last record of the week for this week is um, The Impressions, This Is My Country. Um, <coughs> this is uh, my favorite record of The Impressions. This is 
right before Curtis leaves to go solo, um, you know, the the title track is a is a real poignant, you know, uh, and completely applicable uh, song in the in the times that we're in. Um, and then there's another another track called "Love's Happening" that I love a lot. But my favorite my favorite impression song of all of them is a song called Fool For You, which uh, which is on this record. Um, it's not my favorite Curtis song, um, but my favorite song of the impressions. And uh, I actually am uh, gonna take, uh, take a crack at, at playing it for you right now. Um, that's my records of the week though, so happy listening, um, support your local record stores, and, uh, and, uh, you know, I just can't, I can't tell you how much joy it brings to my life, you know, every day to sort of like have it be a part of my daily routine with my family of listening to records that I haven't either listened to in a while or haven't listened to at all. You know, I make a conscious effort to try and listen to stuff that I haven't listened to before, uh, whether it's new or old. And um, it's so important. It's so important as a musician because what you put in yourself I've talked about this a bunch but it's, what you put in yourself is what's going to come out so if you're only putting one thing in it consistently then that's all you're going to sound like you know that's all that your 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 depth is only going to be increased by the more you put in it you know and um, for me it's just fun I just love it I love listening to new music i get bored i don't like listening to you know with the exception of a hand few handful of things you know obviously funkadelic is one of them there's a handful of things that i never really get sick of but i even give that stuff a break sometimes you know um but uh but yeah you know the discovery process is to me the most fun of being a music fan so anyway <clears throat> so i'm gonna try and do this song for you i actually used to do this in the first incarnation uh, of uh, Simo of the band, me and Frank and Adam, uh, we did like a real powerful rock version of Fool Free. I'm gonna do it uh, like like the Impressions did it. And uh, anyway, hopefully I make it through it. It goes like this.
things that keep me up at night. I just want to let go. I just want to let go and let my light shine. But you know, the only thing that stands in the way is me, is me, is me, is me, is me. Is me. go. Sort of made it through it. A fool for you. It's my favorite impressions track. It's a groovy one, man. It's a groovy one. And the track on the record is just so cool because it's got all these beautiful horns and big old drums with a lot of reverb on them. Just beautiful. <sighs> I feel good. You feeling good? So, uh, moving on. Moving on to the next portion of the show as I tune and talk to you at the same time, if you can believe that. Uh, ooh, ooh, that one got a little out there. D-string, D-string got a little out, folks. Why didn't you tell me? So, anyway. I tuned because I'm supposed to. Anyway. So, uh, for the rig of the week this week, I wanted to talk briefly uh, about a little concept that keeps coming up. Uh, in conversation I have with people and the notion is that um, playing cleaner is generally better now it's not good to talk in generalities typically because there's always exceptions to, to rules ladies and gentlemen but um, It's a common trend these days um, for guitarists to become very used to essentially kind of compression, an extra layer of compression, um, which sometimes is achieved by using compressors, um, but uh, most of the time it's people using overdrives and using too much drive and it tends to sort of take away dynamics and it also kind of inhibits musicians from developing their hands into becoming um, the best that they can be and tone as we all know begins and ends right here your hands no matter what instrument you play Obviously, if you play guitar or bass, it's really apparent, but like how a drummer, how a drummer plays, you know, you can sit a million, you know, a bunch of different drummers down at the same kit and they're all going to sound different because they all have different touch. And same thing with a piano player, okay? Um, same thing with horn players, you know, it's, it's, um, there, everybody has like their own, develops their own way that they speak through their instrument. And so, um, the lesson sort of that I wanted to share, or the notion, is getting back to 
uh, I get asked an awful lot about like being a minimalist and not using a lot of effects or any at times and um, I'm not anti-pedal um, not that anybody accuses me of that but I always want to be very clear about that because I think that um, when effects are used in creative ways um, it enhances the music you know just like a great piece of equipment is supposed to um, but you know much like a golfer I'll use I'll use a golf analogy for Adam out there um, you know much like you know if you take an amazing set of clubs away from an incredible golfer he's still an incredible golfer the little bit of edge that he gains from using those nice clubs obviously helps but it's like you know he's a great golfer so it's like it's not it's a means to an end it's not the most important part of the equation you have to ha you have to be the good golfer first for it to really make a difference and the same is um, with instruments with effects and all this kind of stuff where um, you know if you got a good foundation and you got a good sound coming from your hands then if you put stuff on top of that it's going to be great because you know uh, just like you know, cooking. You, get, you use a cooking analogy of you know, if you if you're a good cook, um, uh, you can take very minimal ingredients and make something really great with it. You know, and um, a person who's not a good cook can take the most expensive ingredients and ruin them. You know, so anyway, we could go on and on here, and this could become a John Mulaney skit quickly. Um, but. Uh, Anyway, I wanted to say in relation to playing cleaner, um, when I started playing with Don Kelly, um, when I was you know 21, you know I started with a really big board and it had boosters and 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 compressors and multiple overdrives and multiple delays and all this kind of stuff. You know, normal. You know what would be construed as uh, still still in 2020 a, a fairly normal uh, setup and. Uh, over time, I sort of whittled it back and like took one thing at a time out of it. Uh, just sort of teaching myself to use stuff better and not have as many options and try and learn, you know, like, oh, this one particular thing does multiple things well, so I'll use it for that instead of using multiple things adequately, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, that was a gradual process, and eventually I got down to just using a delay pedal, an old Electro Harmonix Memory Man, uh, for months, um, had it sitting on top of my deluxe reverb, and I was using it for delay, but I was also using it to sort of hit the front end of the amp a little bit harder, which gave me a little more extra compression, a little more extra gain, which made it easier under my fingers to sort of to, to play. So finally, I showed up and I just was like, all right, I'm going to play tonight with nothing. I'm not going to use it. And uh, <coughs> pardon me, the. Um, then what happened as a result of it was immediately it sounded the way I wanted it to sound. It sounded great, but it was hard to, it, like my consistency went down because it was harder to play, okay? Um, like literally under my fingers because I didn't have that extra thing sort of holding me up a little bit. And, uh, but I just, you know, I was like, but that's the sound I've been looking for. So I just committed to it. And it only took a couple of nights to sort of get the muscle memory and get my strength in my hands to a point where it wasn't hindered anymore. And since then, I've been the way that I am now in that, you know, um, I go through phases of using some effects and no effects. And, uh, you know, I went through a phase earlier this year where I had like a, a ring mod and a bunch of other things that I was experimenting with and I always have fun with it and it always leads me to really creative places and uh, I'm always kind of moving and uh, looking for inspiration from different things and um, uh, but the point being is that I, the point I'm trying to make is that like uh, especially during these times where you know we're not playing out and we're all kind of contained and it's a amazing time to practice it's an amazing time you know I, I I have diligently sat and played along to records um, almost daily 
and learn stuff that I should have learned 20 years ago. And I mean, I've really utilized these several months, and I've become, you know, I, I can't say that um, uh, uh, it, it shows, but I feel, at least from my perspective, I feel like a better musician than I've ever been because I've really focused myself in a way that I haven't since I was younger. I've really taken the opportunity to do the things that I can't do when I'm on tour and tearing apart records and really learning them and kind of getting inside the records and trying to understand why it feels so good and trying to drill, work on timing. Timing is a big thing. Um, you know, uh, uh, most people want to rush um, and uh, I, st I rush from time to time, I'm embarrassed to say. Um, uh, occasionally I get uh, I get in there and I can I can you know when I'm cool calm and collected I can breathe and, and get in there pretty decent but uh, um, playing along to records is really important um, because if you're just practicing alone uh, or you're practicing to a metronome uh, practice to a metronome is boring to me and if you're practicing alone you have no uh, sort of uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Accountability. If your timing's shit, okay. So, if you're playing along to a record, and you're really playing to the record, and you're not, you know, like, and when I say playing along to a record, playing the record, not soloing over the record, like, play rhythm, pl learn the parts to the song, and play to it, you know, um, because just soloing over over songs or or something like that isn't going to teach you anything and it certainly isn't going to refine you um, but like actually getting in and learning a song and playing it you know you're 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 working on your timing you're working on your ears you're 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 refining your ability to have better pocket all those things so um, but anyway uh, to drill home the, the the point for the final time as I continue to beat this dead horse um, Figuratively speaking, I don't condone the beating of anything. Um, and uh, but uh, uh, if you strip away in this time when we're not playing live and you have nothing to lose, um, and sort of learn to play with nothing or next to nothing, and sort of work on your hands, um, you'd be. I think you really would be surprised at how much better it's going to sound. Um, and then reintroduce different types of effects into the equation once you get a good firm grasp on that because it's going to sound better and um, most if not all of my you know heroes well no all of them there, there isn't anyone that, that, that this doesn't equate to <laughs> on any instrument um, uh, all of my heroes have that in common where it's like if you take it all away from them they're still they're still great you know um, but in, in regards to effects, I mean, I look at people like Dave Gilmore and I look at people like Jimi Hendrix and uh, even Prince, you know, those people that uh, uh, Tom Morello is one, uh, Nels Klein is one in the modern day. Um, all these people use, all these people are fantastic musicians with wonderful voices and they use, they use effects to, um, to kind of uh, enhance what's already there. And so... It may seem like a lot of things I talk about, like common sense, and it is. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, I wanted to share that because it's come up multiple times um, in conversations I've had over the last week or so. So uh, so anyway, you with me? We groovy. So uh, I'm gonna do a tune right now. I'm gonna, uh, gonna do one more song, and then we'll get into uh, the topic of psych. I live by it, baby. I'm a psycho. I got problems. No. So uh, I'm going to do a tune for, for Adam out there. And uh, um, I'm going to do a um, do a Shuggy Otis uh, thing. Uh, and I'm tuning one more time. I actually broke down and put some new strings on this, believe it or not. And, um, and they're... Uh, this guitar is like, what did you do that for? I don't know. I should have just left the old funky ones on. They sound better anyway. 
but uh, this is my attempt at doing sort of a thing uh, like Sweet Thing, which is on uh, uh, Freedom Flight, which is my favorite Should Be on this record. So here we go.
man. You know, the only, um, the only he's uh, that's the only guitar player that plays slide that uh, does the Earl Hooker thing. Um, I fell in love with Earl Hooker completely kind of aside from uh, from Shuggy Otis. I love Shuggy Otis a lot. I actually got a question about whether I love Shuggy Otis or not recently. Of course I do! I love Shuggy. Um, or as I like to say, the other is Stevie Wonder. Or uh, Prince number one. <laughs> um, but no, I love, I love Shuggy a lot. And when he would play slide, like on Sweet Thing like that, he does the Earl Hooker thing. I just love that slide playing, man. You know, as much as I love Ry Cooter and I love, um, of course, love Dwayne Allman and Elmore James and Robert Nighthawk and, and um, George Harrison and uh, Pete Ham from Badfinger and all these different slide players, Dave Lindley. Um, I, uh, I absolutely, you know, it's no mistaking. Earl Hooker is my man, uh, but uh, so is Shuggy, because we're coming from the same place. All right, so let's let's get into the psych portion of the show. Y'all ready? All right. So psychedelic music. What the hell is psychedelic music? Well, the easiest way to quantify it is it is the music made or listened to under the influence of psychedelics. <laughs> uh, which uh, is the easiest answer. Um, which is correct. <laughs> um, but as sort of um, an art form, I view psychedelic music as something that whether it's in the rock genre whether it's in the blues genre whether it's in the soul genre or whether it's in the jazz genre the introduction of psychedelia to me means sort of a a, a freedom okay there's a, there's a sense of unorthodox sort of sort of freedom to expound um, typically you know sonically and uh, for certain, you know, uh, through arrangement and the use of uh, unusual sounds and instruments, and uh, and at times, you know, uh, utilizing different types of improvisational elements that are not normally found within that genre. And obviously, the psychedelic movement of the 1960s, um, you know, corresponds with, you know, that being introduced into all these different mediums and it still exists to this day there's a huge underground of bands um, and artists both extremely popular and and under the radar that um, that in company uh, uh, you know psych influence in in their records uh, I'm certainly one of them <laughs> um, and uh, um, I'll talk about some contemporary people coming up, but you know, almost every week on the show, when I talk about records of the week, you know, uh, there's there's an underlying sense of psychedelic influence on you know the vast majority of the contemporary people I talk about, whether it's the Budos Band or whether it's uh, Alabama Shakes or or whether it's uh, um, uh, Patrick Sweeney or or, or whether it's uh, 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 it could be uh, Shakedown or, or whether it's GA20 or whether, you know, on and on and on, all the people that I talk about. So, um, what I wanted to talk about in, in particular is I want to talk about some, some records that, to me, sort of um, completely reinvigorated a genre of music with psychedelic influence and changed things ever after and had a huge impact okay and there's a couple of uh, I don't think any of my choices are going to be that surprising but I didn't like I purposely didn't include like Jimi Hendrix or the Beatles or something like that because I feel like that's kind of like a given okay um, 
so I, I wanted to focus on, on some other things. So the big, you know, the main big story I wanted to, to talk about was um, sort of what I view as the stake in the ground of like the original, like when psychedelic influence first rippled and really, really infiltrated the San Francisco scene, okay? Um, and as I tell this story, it'll become clear what I'm talking about. So the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, right? This is a, a, a record called East West. This record changed my life when I heard it when I was 18. The Paul Butterfield Blues Band, of course, featured one of my biggest heroes, the great, the great Michael Bloomfield. And um, Michael is a completely unsung hero in the world of guitar. Um, he's a huge hero of mine. He changed my life, his influence. You know, in short, I'll do a full episode on Michael coming up soon. But in short, you know, Michael grew up in Chicago. He was a rich, uh, rich Jewish kid from the north suburbs who would go into the south side of Chicago in the 50s and the early 60s when no one would do that unless you belong there. And he went down there and he was tutored and loved by Muddy Waters and Holland Wolf and Big Joe Turner and, and uh, or Big Joe Williams, I, I apologize, and, uh, and Lil Walter and everybody. They, they loved Michael like a son. Michael was their protege. And uh, Michael became very prominent in the 60s for his association first with Bob Dylan having played on like a Rolling Stone. And then when Dylan goes electric at the Newport Folk Festival in 1965, that's Michael right behind him, blaring away, playing his heart out. So the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, they made their first record, which is one of my favorite records of all time, but this is their second record, okay? Now, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, just like um, the Fabulous Thunderbirds uh, later in the late 70s, this is as authentic of like a baby boomer or second generation blues band can get. This is real blues. This is not rock music. This is this is the real thing. Um, these are young young guys that were you know in the case of uh, Sam Lay and Jerome Arnold, the rhythm section. They were the rhythm section for Holland Wolf, for God's sake. Um, even though Billy Davenport took over on drums. Um, around the time of East West here. But uh, the thing that's important about this album is the title track, East West. And uh, I'll come back to my home screen. So the album itself is is a Chicago low-down, you know, dirty record, blues record, real blues. Um, but the track East West is a modal jam over basically like an Indian raga type of feel, okay? Because Michael, in particular, was incredibly uh, influenced by Indian music. Uh, you know, obviously Ravi Shankar being the most notable. But he was also incredibly influenced by modal jazz, which right around this time is when A Love Supreme comes out. Uh, my favorite things that come out the year before, uh, John Coltrane. Um, so, taking that template of from what was the very beginnings of free jazz and the influence of Indian music and putting it in an electric blues band and jamming over it, and in some cases it would last, like on the record, it's like 13 minutes long which again is unheard of for that time period. This is 1965, by the way. So like the Beatles are releasing help, okay? That's what's going on in the mainstream. You know, Sonny and Cher are releasing I Got You, Babe. Um, and this record comes out. And it's an underground record. It's not a huge, successful record. The Paul Butterfield Blues Band is, a, is an underground band. They're, 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 they're big on college campuses and, and, uh, and stuff like that. So there's one really important thing that happens as a result of the East-West record. 
they go, they get booked into a place in San Francisco called the Fillmore Auditorium. Um, not by Bill Graham, by Chet Helms. And um, Chet Helms and his first partner booked the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. And these are they're kids. They're like they're 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 like 20, 21 years old, twenty two years old, um, trying to be promoters. They're they're young they're young beatniks turning into hippies. This is like beat, as as beatniks were turning into hippies, um, and uh, they wanted to book this band because Albert Grossman, who managed the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, also managed Bob Dylan and Peter Paul and Mary, and the band. He would later manage the band, but he wanted to get in with Albert Grossman. So he's he's like, all right, we'll book these guys. Um, if they're with Grossman, they should be great. And they got freaked out because they booked them for like two thousand dollars or twenty five hundred dollars or something for for the weekend. And um, they went down to L.A. to see the Butterfield Blues Band play uh, the week before. And there was no one there because nobody knew about the Paul Butterfield Blues Band on the West Coast. Um, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band was popular in New York, in the East, in Boston, you know, the East Coast, Chicago, parts of the South, but they weren't big on the West Coast. So Chet and his partner freak out and go back to San Francisco, and like blanket the city of San Francisco, telling everybody that this is the best band that, was, <laughs> that ever existed, and you have to come to the show so they don't lose their ass, right? So. Uh, I think they were booked like Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They might have been booked more, but they were at least booked Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So they show up first night at the at the at the Fillmore, and the the, the location of the Fillmore that's still there that I was very grateful to get to play uh, twice in this last year. Um, and uh, that room in particular is very special to me because of this story. Um, but they show up, and the first night's packed; it's sold out. And they kill because nobody in San Francisco has seen a polished, hardcore, real deal blues band. But then they do East West. And live, they would play it for sometimes they say 45 minutes, you know? Now, again, this is it's 1965, okay? This is a full two years before the Summer of Love, okay? The important thing about this is the Butterfield Blues Band does this show and then word spreads like wildfire all over San Francisco and the next two nights quickly sell out and everybody is there. And when I say everybody, the the who would be come the Grateful Dead were there in attendance. Um, they weren't even the Grateful Dead yet. Okay. Uh, future members of the Jefferson Airplane were there. Carlos Santana, a, a teenaged Carlos Santana, who was still in Mission High School, was there. Uh, Jim Cipollina from Quicksilver Messenger Service was there. This is be long before they put their band together. Basically, all and, and future members of Big Brother and the Holding Company. Basically, everybody that would define the psychedelic movement was in attendance at this show. And were forever changed by access to this performance. And the very concept of like jamming and that looseness, that, that, that thing that, that came from East-West was sort of the, the, the ignition, if you will, to what then was adopted by all those bands in San Francisco and bands like Fleetwood Mac from from England, of course, the Allman Brothers Band, and uh, and on down the line, you know, to current jam bands and stuff like that. But it's like that's the that's the truly the nucleus of where that all comes from. And I've talked to uh, I, I talked a little bit to Phil Lesh about it. I, I I've talked to uh, other people about this, and you know, it's it surprises me why this is never talked about. How important this was, you know. Because again, this is a full year and a half before Hendrix comes out, okay? Like this is this is before Paperback Writers even out, okay? Like this is this is very very early, okay? And it only un it only kind of underscores the importance of the influence of Michael Bloomfield because 
before Hendrix, before Jeff Beck, before Eric Clapton, before all of the baby boomer guitar players, there was Michael Bloomfield. He was there first. And he was the 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 heir apparent to um, to the true real blues. Um, and he's a great personification of like he could jam and he could he could he could play on a Dylan record and sound perfectly in place. He could jam and get as far out as Ornette Coleman could. But then he could go and play with Muddy Waters. And that's still to this day endlessly impressive to me. Because he was what I would consider to be, you know, as well rounded of a guitar player as there ever has been. And as depthful and as important. So East West, I'll put it up again. To me, I believe this record is the beginning of the psychedelic movement and certainly the beginning of jamming within the context of rock music. So, are you with me? So that's the most important one. These other ones are important as well, but that's the most important one, I feel. The next one is from just a few months later, or around the same time, actually, this record. Having a rave up, the Yardbirds, with a very young Jeff Beck playing guitar this record comes out and you know this is some of the first stuff I ever learned to play but you know Obviously, that's Heart Full of Soul. And um, one of the tracks on Having a Rave Up, another one is their version of I'm a Man. Anyway, I could go on and on and on and on and on and on. But the point I wanted to make and why I think it's really important is, you know, obviously the Yardbirds were incredibly like influential coming up to when are your experience is released now you know obviously hendrix comes out and it just completely dominates the landscape but this is out you know a good year or so before and the use of fuzz tones the use of sort of what they call rave ups where it's you know essentially their version of jamming if you will um was you know a precursor to all of that and again jeff beck is sort of on the forefront of utilizing weird sounds and using indian type of melody and um uh you know psychedelic influence you know and uh for me personally um i'm a i'm a really big yardbirds fan um i i love I mean, that record, I actually have a, uh, in the other room, I have a great um, first pressing that I found years ago of, uh, of having a rave up, and it's one of the records that I cherish, um, because they're, they're not easy to find, and, and it's a British pressing, too, um, but um, I prefer the Jeff Beck era, that era, uh, the best. I like the songs. Um, uh, with 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 all due respect to to Jimmy Page and to also to Eric Clapton, I obviously uh, feel that uh, you know this era that having a rave up had the biggest impact on me, and I think it had the bigger impact on what was going on around it because the Beatles were aware of it, um, Hendrix was aware of it. You know, Hendrix was a big fan of Jeff Beck's. You know, he was a big fan of the Yardbirds, and it was also a big. You know, it was an influence to Jimmy Page, you know, because, I mean, Jimmy would obviously join the band uh, relatively close, you know, not long after having a rave up came out. 
and um, you know, I with I, I I mean Jimmy Page is a brilliant writer, musician. You know, he's he's fucking Jimmy Page. What do you want me to say? But um, but he's uh, I I certainly you know it's put it this way. If you listen to the Jeff Beck Group's first album, Truth, and then you listen to Zeppelin One, you can absolutely see that. Jimmy basically took Jeff's template of the sound, the style, the 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 approach, the lineup, um, the type of singer, the type of drummer, all this kind of stuff, and 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 basically kind of did his version of the same thing. He was very influenced by Jeff, you know, and uh, that's not to say that what they did isn't amazing because it is. It changed the world, but. Um, for me, I just, you know, I think Jeff Beck is a Mount Olympus, and uh, personally, I love his playing with the Yardbirds, because it's, because it's raw, and it's before um, all of the technical ability that would come later was there, and you just had piss and vinegar, and a lot of attitude. It's like punk rock guitar, you know, meets the blues, you know? So I wanted to put that in there, because from a rock perspective... Um, I think that that's an important kind of first step, you know, because it's like moving towards our experience. Does that make sense? So the next record is uh, in the jazz idiom, and it's a record I've talked about before, and it's uh, Bitches Brew. It should come as no surprise. Um, You know, this record is one of my all-time favorite records, and... This obviously is, I think, still the the highest selling jazz record of all time, and um, it's Miles adopting the influences of who I've talked about many times his lo- his lovely uh, his lovely and talented uh, wife at the time, the great Miss Betty Davis. Here's a better picture of her, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know she introduced Miles to. Sly and the Family Stone. She introduced Miles to Jimi Hendrix. She introduced Miles to Cream. She introduced Miles to the Beatles. Um, She obviously was a free spirit and was not afraid to tell Miles Davis what she thought and was very much Miles' muse. And as a result of which, you go from you know, the Italian suits and thousand dollar loafers. Um, you know, I mean, Miles was many times voted, you know, like GQ's man of the year, best dressed back in the 60s, um, to the image we have of Miles uh, with the with the huge bug glasses and the leather and the the freaky clothes and sort of the alien miles and that's a that's the influence of betty davis and that obviously that's his that's her influence on his style but musically she opened him up to all these different psychedelic influences and so you know bitches brew comes out which she actually she titled even betty davis um miles wanted to call the record witches brew and uh in her lovely way betty was like nah bitches brew and miles loved it because he loved the word bitch apparently and this obviously i mean bitches brew was was lambasted by the jazz press when it came out of like that miles is ruining jazz and what is this this is nothing but noise and um you know it was hated i mean it was hated um, but Miles, he plowed forward and he did something really bold, you know, like, like, and I've talked about this before that it's like only people like Miles Davis and Bob Dylan, you know, and the Beatles, you know, there's only a handful of artists that like have taken those kind of creative leaps and done it defiantly and successfully, you know, um, there's a lot of artists that do the same thing over and over and over and over again. And, um, you know, the first version of it is amazing and really successful. And the second version is 
maybe sort of as successful and not quite as amazing and it just kind of goes on from there and it's like you know those those special people neil young is another one of those people you know Joni mitchell was one of those people um that um uh continually um you know they continue to walk down an artistic path of of discovery and it's really fun to be a fan of uh artists like that because you just never know what they're going to do for you next you know um, and it's incredible to go back and look at a body of work like any of those people I just mentioned because you can't like I mean everything is so different from one another and it's so and they're all equally so amazing so anyway Bitches Brew to me is like the you know obviously there wouldn't be fusion there wouldn't be um, a lot that came after it you know it kind of changed everything for jazz and to me it's the iconic jazz psychedelic record you know um the uh the next record that i wanted to talk about which again is not going to come as any surprise but in, in the concert so i've talked about you know blues and sort of I've, I've talked about psychedelic blues meaning you know the paul butterfield blues band and also sort of the what i consider the nucleus of it you know which is the east west record of of the whole psychedelic you know musical thing and I talked about the Yardbirds, you know, which is psychedelia kind of getting infused into rock music. And now I've talked about jazz, and now I want to talk about soul, which obviously I can only talk about one record, which is Hot Buttered Soul um, by Isaac Hayes, which is the introduction of psychedelic influence into soul music. You know, prior to this record, soul music was Otis Redding, it was Aretha Franklin, it was... Um, Sam and Dave, it was Motown. You know, this is right when the landscape was changing. And so the addition of weird sounds, you know, fuzz tones and wah-wah pedals and tape delays and, and extended jamming um, and, um, and freakiness um, was new, you know, just like it was in every other idiom. And so this has continued to be you know, one of the most inspiring records of my whole life. And, um, you know, Isaac, who I've talked about before and his um, long-standing work as an incredible songwriter writing songs like Soul Man and When Something Is Wrong With My Baby and Hold On, I'm Coming for Sam and Dave. Um, and then, you know, the story of Hot Buttered Soul, which I'll tell, I'll tell really quick. So, you know, after... Um, after Otis Redding dies in the horrific plane crash in uh, December of 67. Um, basically, the entire year of 1968, Stax Records in Memphis, Tennessee, um, is, is, is on, the urge, uh, on the edge of, of bankruptcy, of, of, of folding, um, because their star artist is gone. And also, at that same time, Atlantic Records pulled Sam and Dave back because they were actually under contract to Atlantic and they were just leased out to basically they were sent to Memphis to make amazing records that Atlantic Records would make all the money from so they took Sam and Dave back and um, also in the fine print of uh, the distribution agreement that Stax had with um, Atlantic Records in New York um, it became apparent that in the fine print of it, Stax had actually signed away all of the ownership and copyrights of everything that they had done over to Atlantic. And so Atlantic took their entire catalog. Just criminal. Just gutted that, that company. So Stax was in danger of, 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 of disappearing. And... Um, so the great Al Bell, who's still around, I met him a couple of years ago, he's a very charismatic man. Um, the great Al Bell, who was a disc jockey um, from Arkansas, uh, who had come to work at Stax, um, took control and essentially called all of the major distributors at the time and riled them up and said, Stax is not going anywhere, we're rebuilding the company, and we are going to, in the first quarter of 1969, 
we are going to release, I think it was 26 albums, which was unheard of, okay? A, a record company at that time might release, you know, six or eight at the most, okay? But he wanted it to be an astounding amount of records, so essentially it would accomplish two things. One, it would help rebuild the catalog quickly because with that much product out all of a sudden with all the publishing and all the copyrights and all of the mechanical fees and all the things that go into making records it would create immediately a sizable chunk and also something that if achieved if they could pull it off and get them made and get them pressed and get them ready for release um it would be completely like Every other label in the country would, would be dumbfounded because it would make them all look like nothing to all the distributors as far as hard work, as far as output, all those things. So as a result of this, everyone who worked at Stax, which there weren't many, you're talking about Booker T and the MGs, you're talking about, you know, David Porter and Isaac Hayes, you're talking, you know, you're only talking about like, you know, 15, 18 people, okay, the family of Stax. There's only so many musicians, so many producers, so many engineers to go around. And to get all these records cut and recorded and mixed and, and ready to go, they were working round the clock to get this done. And any of you who've made records or been involved in the making of records nowadays would, will understand uh, what an undertaking, um, you know, trying to achieve, you know, essentially in, in, a, in a few months' time, to, 26 albums ready to go. So Isaac, selfishly, went to Jim Stewart, the founder of Stax, and said, well, you know, I'm helping you. I'm writing all these songs for all these artists. I'm producing a lot of these artists. I'm supervising the sessions for a lot of these artists, and I'm playing on it. May I make my own record? Selfishly. And Jim was like, sure, you can do what you want. And so I actually, you know, had the great privilege to talk to Michael Tolles and James Alexander. Uh, Michael's the guitar player on Hot Buttered Soul, and he was the guitar player in the Bar Kays. Um, and James Alexander was the bass player. Um, and they made, they basically got the okay to go to Ardent Studios, which was a separate studio. Now it's in a different location than it was back then, but Ardent Recording Studio is still around. It's a very famous recording studio in Memphis that uh, uh, if, you, if you're fans of Big Star, all those records were made there. Um, uh, Led Zeppelin uh, 2 was mixed there. Um, uh, a lot of uh, REM records and a lot of iconic albums were made. Um, but uh, this is obviously back in, in late 68, early 69. So uh, Isaac grabbed the bar case who uh, had a hit uh, single called Soul Finger and um, actually were, at the time, they were Otis Redding's backup band, actually. And this is a photo of them the night before the fatal plane crash. And only two members of uh, the bar case survived. Uh, the bass player, James Alexander, who you see uh, to the left of Otis, and Ben Colley, the trumpet player, uh, second from right. Um, the other gentleman perished in the plane crash with Otis, unfortunately. And um, so the Barquets regrouped um, and added new members uh, after that. And Michael Tolles, my hero, uh, was the guitar player. Uh, he was a 17-year-old guitar player at the time. So. Uh, Isaac didn't have a band, so he grabbed the Barquets, they went to Arden, and made Hot Buttered Soul. And uh, James Alexander and Michael both told me that it was like a day, day and a half, that was it. That the, uh, the versions you hear on the record um, of those songs is generally like the one take that they had. And it is soulful, it is funky, it is psychedelic, it is singular, it's incredible. And it's absolutely one of my favorite albums of all time. And to me, like records like Funkadelic and records like um, uh, all, all, what was to happen in soul music, the infusion of fuzz tones and wah-wah pedals and 
obviously like you know with with at, at Motown the uh, the the Norman Whitfield era of uh, Papa was a Rolling Stone and uh, Cloud Nine and all that stuff was you know the monumental success of the Isaac Hayes Hubbard Soul record was a big influence on all that and so to finish the story you know Isaac makes this record in a day and a half turns it in and it's one of the 26 albums that's coming out and no one has any expectations for this record um, it's just Isaac's thing that he went and had some fun that goes on to sell I think it was like over six million copies and be the biggest hit of all of those 26 albums and completely save stacks from going under and Isaac then became a massive massive superstar in the you know R&B world in the black world I mean you know a, 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 an arena selling size act and obviously would go on to make uh, the Black Moses record which also went multi-platinum and you know famously make the Shaft soundtrack which won an Academy Award and was actually the first time uh, an African American won an Academy Award it was Isaac Hayes so uh, so that record so in soul music Hot Buttered Soul the last record I want to talk about is um, from the modern era and um it's this record right here, Alabama Shake Sound and Color. I think this is the best record that's been made in the last 20, 25 years. Um, and the reason why I put it in this list is because the use of psychedelic influence, of texture, of uh, sounds. Um, and this record is nothing like the record that made Alabama Shake's a huge stars before this boys and girls um, this came out of nowhere and it's you know I liken it to when you know what it must have felt like when uh, Pet Sounds came out or Sgt. Pepper or Dark Side of the Moon or something like that because you know everyone was sort of waiting for the Alabama Shakes next record and then this comes out and it's so creative and so singular and I just you know earth shatteringly great and in the same breath I would put Brittany Howard's current record Jamie um, this is a, a beautiful vinyl version of it um, in there too I think Brittany is you know I think the term uh, amazing or genius or all that kind of stuff gets thrown around way too much I think she genuinely is, and um, it's just amazing to see what she's been capable of doing, and she incorporates, you know, the psychedelic experience, if you will, um, better than anyone in the current age, and I'm a huge, huge fan. So, uh, so there you go. I could talk about this for days, um, you know. Psychedelia and everything in a company it, 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 it encompasses meaning like lifestyle, literature, you know, talking about, you know, the great beat literature of, of, of Kerouac or, or uh, you know, like a, every person needs to read on the road in their lifetime or, or Timothy Leary and, you know, the, the psychedelic experience and, you know, um, uh, Tom Robbins, you know, every cowgirl gets the blues and, you know, Allen Ginsberg all of that I think is really important and it's something that I'm a really big fan of whether it's you know literature or film you know um, or music I like it I like freedom I like psychedelia and uh, I'm kind of a freak so it suits me well so so you with me this has been a fun episode for me I hope you've dug it um, so, ladies and gentlemen, that just leaves me with one last thing. I have uh, a new song and video to premiere for you tonight. Uh, this is something that uh, Adam and I cooked up uh, the other day. And uh, it's in tribute uh, sort of to two powerful women. 
here we are, it's 100 years uh, after women um, uh, achieved the right to vote in our country, and um, the lick, the main lick of this song is kind of is lifted from, from a Betty Davis song, who I've talked about Betty a bunch, who we love and respect and admire. And uh, the video itself is, uh, is a little uh, uh, sort of uh, encapsulation from uh, one of my favorite female actresses of all time, Pam Greer. Um, uh, my favorite movie of hers is a, is a movie called Coffee, C-O-F-F-Y. Um, people usually will go to Foxy Brown or they'll go to Jackie Brown, the movie she made with Tarantino in the 90s. Um, which Tarantino made in tribute to her films from the 70s, um, but I'm a I'm a big fan of of uh, of Pam. Uh, I think she, obviously she was a beautiful beautiful woman, but um, in an era where like Clint Eastwood was making the Dirty Harry movies and um, sort of the 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 era of action heroes, if you will. Um, was in full swing and would continue on through the 70s and through the 80s with actors like Arnold Schwarzenegger and stuff. Man, Pam was an empowered, empowered woman. And all the roles that she played were about righting wrongs and about avenging uh, injustice. And, um, and she epitomized... Uh, being strong and not taking shit and uh, it's incredibly entertaining and sexy and all those other kind of things as well but uh, at the root of it the thing that I dig about it is that she's a she's she's a strong woman man you know she she don't take no shit so uh, so here without further ado from the house of Greece in the funky basement here is coffee our tribute to Pam Greer and Betty Davis check it out
there you go. So, uh, I'd like to thank you once again for, uh, for joining me. And uh, a lot of you watch this after the actual live stream, so thank you for, for, for finding it. Um, I'd like to ask you, if you haven't already, to you know, uh, follow me on Instagram, follow me on Facebook and Twitter, JD Simo Music, all the above, and also follow the YouTube channel. Um, and subscribe it and share it to your friends. Um, I have a new uh, single, One of Those Days, that is out right now. Uh, stream it on uh, Spotify and Apple Music. You can pre-order my new record. It comes out August 21st. Um, and I'm very excited about it. Um, very excited. And um, thank you for tuning in. I hope that you've been entertained. I hope that uh, you had a good time. Um, as I say every week, you know, it's this is a... Uh, a huge blessing in disguise for me to get to do something uh, that means something to me. You know, everything that I talk about or play or do uh, on the show here is uh, is something that I am into genuinely. Um, these are things that if you and I were just hanging out uh, uh, at, at a gig or something, we would talk about or do anyway, uh, just done in this kind of format. And... I'm really grateful that as a result of the pandemic, I've, I've, I've learned how to sort of use this in this way and hopefully pass something on that's positive and something that um, is of use to the world. Um, so um, just take care of yourselves. Um, please be safe out there. <clears throat> and um, remember uh, tomorrow night, or not tomorrow night, tomorrow night, Saturday night, but Every Sunday, remember to tune into Adam's uh, Dual Drum Jam, um, if you're so inclined. And uh, this upcoming Monday, which uh, is, let's see, what, today's the 10th, so the 13th, Monday, July 13th, uh, remember to, uh, on Instagram, tune in and watch myself and my good friend Kirk Fletcher, the Brothers from Another Mother, live stream at 1 p.m. Eastern this upcoming Monday. Um, and uh, so until then, go in peace, listen to some really good records. If you care to contribute uh, to the House of Greece and, and to myself, I humbly thank you. The, the PayPal and Venmo obviously are there at the bottom of the screen. And uh, as always, folks, keep it greasy. Much love from your brother JD. Thank you and good night.